Home buyers are getting old. No, I mean literally getting old. <laughs> According to the most recent info from the National Association of Realtors, the median age of a home buyer today is 49 years old, guys. Compared to 20 years ago, it was 39 years old. So in 20 years, it moved up 10 years, all right? So think about this. If in 20 more years, it moves up another 10 years to 59, another 20 more years, it moves up to 69, after that, it'll be dead. Meaning that in 40 or 50 years, nobody will ever be able to own a home if things keep going at this pace. Now, maybe that sounds dramatic to you. Maybe it's not, maybe it's realistic, especially all the people that buy into the WEF and think that you know the new world order is coming and that you'll own nothing and be happy, okay? I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I know all these clowns say that's what's going to happen, but at the end of the day, it's up to us if it's going to happen or not, okay? People need to be able to have some control over their own destiny rather than listen to what a bunch of New World Order gurus have to say. But the reality is, guys, the reason why this is happening is not coming as a huge surprise. It's because buying a house is extremely expensive now, okay? If you want to buy a house, you need to have some collateral. You need to have some money saved up. And if you don't, your only way to get it is to go to the bank of mom and dad. And some people just don't have that option, okay? Let's be realistic. You know, some lucky people, some fortunate people do, but not everybody has that. And some people just have to do it on their own from scratch. I mean, right now, even with 6.5% interest rates, where the housing market stands and the prices we have at the median home price, you still need to make about $107,000 a year household in order to be able to afford today's home prices. Well, that's a problem because the average household income is closer to 75K a year. Also, you have a ton of young people today that are just loaded up with student loan debt. They're loading themselves up with credit card debt and car loans that they really can't afford, which sets things back even further. That combined with some poor spending habits of always needing to go to Starbucks and get that latte and whatever people do to waste their money, you know, it's a bad combination, really. And this is bad, guys, because look at this 70 percent of americans surveyed who are between the age of 23 and 40 which a lot of them should already be homeowners right if you're almost 40 or in that age range say that they want to buy a home but they can't afford it 70 percent guys say that they can't afford it and that's probably pretty accurate when you just look at the income figures i discussed before you know when you look at what the average household makes versus what they need to make to be able to buy a house today, then it's no wonder most people say they can't afford it because they literally can't. And what this really says, guys, is it says something about our economy, you know? This is basically, you know, the, the rising median age of the home buyer right now is a reflection of the broader economic and regulatory challenges, you know, that disproportionately affect younger people. But I do believe that there is going to be hope on the horizon okay number one right now we don't have a supply shortage we have a listing shortage that's a very very big difference guys there are a lot of houses out there but a lot of them are just not for sale well the home builders are doing their part right now to try to get us caught up because there is like like 1.5 million homes under construction right now something crazy like that you know numbers we haven't seen in a really long time and so the home builders are building houses right now. There's no doubt about it. They're even saying that they're starting to build smaller houses that are more affordable too, because they realize that that's where the market's at right now. The average person cannot afford a 480 grand for a brand new house. But one other factor hiding in the background here of why we're gonna see prices come down in the future and why we're gonna see more inventory is because of all the baby boomers that need to sell houses, guys. Like literally by the year 2030, every single baby boomer in existence that's still alive will be 65 or older. Okay, and that is at the age where a lot of them are gonna be retiring for good and most likely want to downsize and get out of this big house because they're empty nesters, they don't want or can't afford this big payment anymore or having this big house or cannot deal with the maintenance and the upkeep that comes along with it. And guess what? They're gonna be selling those homes. Now I realize we just hit 2024 and 2030 is still six years away. 
but it's not that far away for younger people, especially when considering that the median age of a home buyer right now is 49. Guys, if people are usually not buying homes until they're 49, you know, and you're say 30, you know, in six more years, you're still very young and still at a very much of an advantage, if you ask me, in terms of being in a good position to buy. And that's not even talking about all of the ones who are just gonna die and have to sell that house anyways. You know, it's gonna go to an estate and it'll first go as an inheritance to any living relatives if they have any equity in the house. And uh, you know, what happens a lot of times when people inherit a house, guys, they sell it. You know, nine times out of 10, they don't keep it. Well, I shouldn't say nine times out of 10 because I remember the figures on this were something around the neighborhood of 75% of people that inherit a property end up selling it. So the vast majority of them will sell the house. That's just the reality. And literally even right now, before we even get to 2030, there are 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day. So imagine what that's gonna do over the next five to 10 years in terms of the housing supply, guys. They're coining the term silver tsunami with this, and that's what they're talking about in terms of how much inventory we could potentially see. And by 2030, when all these baby boomers are 65 or older, that's 20% of the US population. And guess what? The vast majority of them own homes. They're gonna be looking to cash in. They're gonna want that equity for retirement, right? They're gonna want to be able to move to a retirement community potentially and use that money to live a nice life, right? And not have all of the headaches and maintenance of dealing with a the house. They're gonna be wanting to pass that on to the next generation, which is you. So the bottom line is here with this, is you should not be buying into this FOMO mentality that there's not enough homes for sale and prices will only go up forever because we're always gonna be in this situation where there's not enough homes for sale. And some people will say as a counter argument to that as well, look at all the illegals pouring in here, Michael. All these people crossing the border every day are coming in here and the government's giving them free places to live and they're gonna need some, some place to live and all of this, right? Well, that is a valid concern. I am not gonna discount that. I think that is a big threat right now to where things could go in the future. But I'd be willing to bet that most of those people coming in are not gonna be in a financial position to buy a house, okay? They're just not. They're coming here with the shirt on their back, guys, and that's basically it. And you know, to have any shot at buying a house for a lot of these people, they're looking at pulling up with you know, eight to 10 people in a house to live somewhere just to be able to afford something, most likely, you know? So do I think that's gonna have a major impact on, you know, them buying up our property? Probably not. I think the much bigger threat are corporate investors, mom and pop real estate investors, as well as uh, foreign real estate investors that really come in and buy up the real estate because they have the money, guys. I think that's a much bigger threat in terms of who's gonna be buying up these homes. But even those guys aren't gonna buy everything. And it's not even just me saying this, guys. Meredith Whitney, she is a Wall Street economist, and she's somebody that also predicted the 2008 housing crisis. She's the one who's saying this. You know, She's the one coming out and saying, we're gonna have this silver tsunami in the next five to 10 years, and you're gonna see prices go down from this because of the sheer amount of inventory, guys. I think you're gonna, you're gonna see inventory levels go back to where they were you know, a decade ago, and you're gonna see inventory like a lot of people have never seen in their lifetime, which is going to make home prices come down significantly in the future. Now, other people will say also, Michael, you've been talking about a housing crash that's not happening and all of this. Like, this is not really a housing crash. This is a demographic shift, guys. That's what it is. This is just the way economics work that you're gonna see uh, more people put their homes on the market that can't afford them anymore or don't want them anymore because they're getting too old and those houses are going to need to be sold to somebody. But we know from the beginning of this video that at these current prices and rates, the vast majority of people can't afford them. So who's going to come in and buy them? Oh, some people will say it's going to be the corporate investors that are going to come in and buy everything. No, they're not, guys. They buy in very strategic locations and it's very unappealing for them to buy in this current environment, just like any other real estate investor, simply because the profits are not there right now. 
You know, you can't really buy a house and get a good cap rate at these prices and rates and where the rents are at. So what was once appealing to all these Wall Street investors to come in and buy up, you know, America's housing stock is no longer the case because the returns are not there. So they're going to be looking to deploy that capital elsewhere where they can still get the returns that they're looking to get, especially without all the risk and hassle that comes along with landlording. So am I telling people that are you know, in the hot seat right now that want to buy a home, say within the next one or two years to wait five to 10 years until this massive stock of inventory comes up? No, that's not what I'm saying, guys. But I am saying that for people that have sort of lost hope and they see these figures like, wow, the median age for home buyers now is basically 50 years old, to not give up hope just yet, especially if you're younger. Because if you're younger and you're worried about affordability, you're worried about whether or not you're gonna be able to afford a home in the future, I would say the odds are looking very good for you within the next decade if you're just patient and give it time, guys. If I were you, if I was like in my young, early 20s, for example, what I would be doing right now is I would be saving as much as I possibly can, investing as much as I possibly can, and getting ready for that silver tsunami to be able to buy the house I've always wanted to own and it'll finally be affordable. That's what I would be doing. But the thing is, nobody knows the future. Nobody can you know, say for sure anything's gonna happen. But one thing that we do know for sure is that when people die, their houses get sold or inherited and then sold, okay? That's just what happens. So no, while nobody can guarantee exactly what's gonna happen with the housing market, we can guarantee that we're gonna see these listings come in the future. But honestly, guys, I think most people are not going to have to wait five to 10 years for relief because I already see relief on the horizon. You know, I see a lot of chatter about how the 5% mortgage rate is going to be that magic number that's going to unlock the current housing market and put a lot of people in the position where they're ready to sell the ones that have golden handcuffs like we talked about yesterday. Yeah, well, if that's the case, 5% mortgage rates are probably right around the corner in terms of, let's say, within the next year and a half. You know, we're likely to see those 5% rates within that time frame. And if that's going to cause a flood of listings, that's good news for current home buyers. So you might not even have to wait that five to 10 years. You know, if you're younger and you have the time to wait, like I said, and you're in your early 20s, then you probably can't afford to buy a house right now anyways. You're in a position where you're going to be forced to wait. I think the opportunity is going to come knocking on your door right at the right time, right when you're reaching a more stable financial position in your adult life. You know, you're in your early to mid 30s going to see it more listings on the housing market than you've ever seen before and the choice will be yours but for people that are already older and wanting to get more settled down right now i think still you're going to see relief around the corner within the next couple years guys are you going to see prices go down 30 or 40 percent and see this massive crash probably not unless there is a major recession and we see unemployment go up you know to close to double digit territory if that happens then yeah that's on the table but once again that stuff is unpredictable but not so much right because we know that every single time the fed starts cutting interest rates after they've been high for a while that unemployment starts to go up this is a historical fact that we've seen happen time and time again the question mark and the unknown is how much will unemployment go up? Nobody knows, right? That's really the wild card factor here that we have to pay attention to. And that's why predicting the future of the housing market is so difficult because we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know how many times the Fed's gonna cut rates. We don't know how long after that we're gonna hit a recession. We don't know how bad that recession will be. We don't know how much unemployment it will cause, therefore making it impossible to predict exactly what's gonna happen. But we do know that all of those combination of things have happened in the past when we hit these set of circumstances and it's extremely reasonable to think that it's going to happen again and you know what guys people are just not coming back to the market even with interest rates coming down they literally went from eight percent down to six and a half percent and they have the most recent numbers out from the mortgage bankers association of the week during the holidays and 
No surprise that the amount of mortgage applications went down during this time. Obviously, most people are not looking at buying a home, but nonetheless, it is sinking pretty substantially when you just kind of factor out the holidays because compared to two weeks earlier, you know, mortgage applications went down 38%, guys. This is the week that ended December 29th. Even though we ended the year on a lower rate, than it was just a couple months prior to that, the amount of purchase applications is still down 12% from where it was a year ago, guys. So you can say, oh, it's the holidays of why things are slowing down, but it's not just the holidays, okay? Because having mortgage applications down during the same week, 12% from a year ago, that is proof that things are slowing down more than people want to admit or believe right now. But this also paints the picture that I've been talking about here on the channel. Because at this same time, refinance activity is actually 15% higher than it was a year ago. Well, that's interesting because mortgage rates are still uh, higher than they were a year ago. So why are more people refinancing? Well, I've gone over this already a few times on the channel, but people are pulling cash out of the house, guys. People who bought two, three years ago are doing cash out refinances, taking the money out of the property and accepting a higher mortgage payment with a higher interest rate than what they previously had in order to use that money to pay for their lifestyle. It's that simple. That is what is happening right now. So what do you think the future of the housing market is when you see less people going out there wanting to purchase a home even with interest rates dropping combined with more people refinancing their current home with interest rates higher than what they previously had what kind of picture for the future do you think that paints for the housing market to me it's got disaster written all over it now one thing i always tell people here on the channel that is hey if you're if you're struggling to afford to buy a house then maybe you should look at moving to a more affordable area right well, I saw a story today talking about the five most affordable states and where middle class people should be moving. People that have, you know, an average income, you're not poor, but you're not rich, you know, you're just doing okay in life, but you feel priced out of where you live. These are the five places they say you should move to. And, you know, I want your feedback, guys. Like if you've ever been to any of these places or if you currently live in one of these states, let me know if you think this information is valid, okay? The first one they say is Ohio. The average home price there is only $216,000 and the cost of living is 7.8% below the national average and a middle class income there is only $44,000 a year. So you can live a nice lifestyle on $44,000 a year in Ohio. They talked to a real estate agent there saying that there's plenty of nice affordable homes around and um, at reasonable prices and the cost of living is low but the quality of life is high. Is that true? I've never been to Ohio, guys. I can't say one way or another, so I don't have an opinion on that. But if you live in Ohio, let me know if this is the case. Now, the next one is North Carolina. Now, I know North Carolina is getting expensive, especially, you know, in the big metros, because that's where a lot of people have been moving to. In fact, 11 out of the last 12 years, North Carolina has been a growing state, okay? But the average home price there is 320 grand, cost of living is 3.8% below the national average, and a middle class income there is about $51,000 a year. So still well below you know, what the, the median household income is, suggesting that you could still live a pretty nice life in North Carolina. Tennessee, Tennessee's average home price is 309,000, cost of living 9.6% below the national average, and the middle class income there is $50,000 a year. And once again, guys, in Tennessee, it really depends on where you're talking about. If you're to go into Nashville right now, living in Nashville and buying a house there is almost on par with how expensive it is here in Miami now. So obviously, these are just statewide averages that we're talking about here. But in the more desirable metros, you can easily be priced out even on a middle class income. And the next one they say is Texas. Average home price in Texas is still 296,000 and cost of living is 7% below the national average. The minimum middle class income required there is about $55,000 a year. Even though I've been through Texas a couple times driving through on my road trip, everywhere there is just so different, guys, especially when it comes to the cost of living. But like for example, when I pass through Amarillo, Texas, if you can get past the fact that, you know, there's a lot of cow farms nearby, 
you know, it's very cheap to live over there. I saw nice houses there well below $300,000, which is, you know, within line of what they're saying here. And it seemed like a pretty nice place to live overall. And then the last one on the list is Michigan. Average home price is 232,000, 9% below the average cost of living nationwide. Middle class income there is only $47,000 a year. So, those are five states that you could look at moving to if you want to be able to be a homeowner and you're tired of always trying to play catch up, feeling like you're always behind and you can just never keep up, guys. Like there are options out there, but you have to be willing to move. You have to be willing to make sacrifices if, you know, becoming a homeowner is like your number one goal in life, essentially. One last thing I have to throw into this video that's totally unrelated to everything that we said, but I saw this and I just thought it was funny. Check this out. In California, okay, the driverless cars that they have over there, because this is where the epicenter of these driverless cars are taking place right now. They're experimenting with this. They have driverless taxis in places like San Francisco. The cops are exempt from giving these driverless cars any sort of traffic ticket. So if they blow a red light, can't ticket them. They speed, you can't ticket them. They hit something, you can't ticket them. And this is all thanks to a loophole in California state law, which is pretty funny considering these guys make more laws than anybody else I know of. It's still no law about this yet. And basically the law says that no citation for a moving violation can be issued if the autonomous vehicle is being operated in driverless mode. The only thing that they can do is give them parking fines. That's it. They can't give them any moving violations for these driverless cars. But they have driverless cars in Texas and Arizona too, but they have been keeping up and they have made laws where they can ticket these guys but somehow California is falling behind and also when I was there I remember hearing about a story where there was a driverless car that crashed into a fire truck in San Francisco and they the driverless car company blamed the fire truck driver saying it was their fault but somehow the driverless car was not responsible for this accident guys like so these companies that own these driverless cars, they don't want to take the blame for anything. If the car does something ridiculous, they don't want to be on the hook for it. And so far, California is making that easy for them. So just another funny little anecdote of our upside down world. And if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.